Pictures from Cezanne by Alex Bickley Read by Richard Bickley Lake Annecy At first the haze of brushstrokes blurs the view Playful inaccuracies, nothing big Just heightening colour, optimising light We trust the painter to relay the scene Report back like some unbiased journalist create something resembling photography. Then furthered by digitization, scanned and put on the web, then printed off small on an old dot matrix, not ideal, sliced up with a guillotine, pared down to match the size of my Amex and half-filled loyalty cards, carefully slipped behind a plastic sheet inside my wallet, not terribly clean, with flecks of black leather on the outside, but in this way I am always carrying with me a little view of France, my own fine art collection. Sitting in the tower, I take it out and balance it on my knee, look for an old receipt, and scribble down. At first, the haze of brushstrokes blurs the view. Still life with onions. Due to an unfortunate breakdown in communication, the flowers died. They remain on my desk. The water I tried to save them with half fills a Thatcher's cider glass and a bottle of Lucasaid. I have twice gone round collecting the petals and leaves that have fallen from the now bare stems, their black edges like outlines in a still life. Stapler and pritch stick replace the standard fruit and milk jug. I prepare myself to throw them out, carefully washing the glass waiting for the shirts to dry. Flicking through an old library book of glossy dog-eared Cezanne prints, my fingers caress oranges and onions. It is sixteen days since you bought me flowers, five or six since they died. I still love them passionately. The Church of Montagny sur Loire. Professionally childlike, created by even lines and random dabs of pastel colours. Between 45 degree rooftops on several houses, the illusion of shafts of light from bare paper. The shade of the arched church windows matches the rectangular windows below. I wonder, if the bell in the church of montagny sur loing was scheduled to toll, would the sound rise up and die in the empty paper, or hang low and bounce through the streets? In Heidelberg we take the philosopher's walk, appearing on the hilltop as various Sunday services kick out. The bells, as though playing in a round, though I imagine each disregarding of their neighbours, begin to chime. The sound both rises and dies as it reaches us, and echoes through the cobbled alleys and cafes. What terrible harmony! The Bridge at Marseille I have spilled the flowers. I first moved them from my desk to the chest of drawers, tidying. Later, to tie my shoelace, I placed my foot upon the third drawer up, bringing the whole thing down. The postcard of the little bridge looks even more eerie now soiled by the dead flower's water. Still holding the two roses I caught as they fell, foot still up, I stare down at the third resting on the bridge. Water droplets bend the light, darken and lighten the colours, add new greens to the trees and to the lake. I leave the mess, my new jeans soaked, my shoelace still untied. The whole image is as though reflected in a pool. Still life with cherries and peaches. Yesterday, for the first time in my life, I bought cherries. Now my fruit bowl, minus a couple of bananas, looks like Cezanne's. The stems form as fleeting glances of playful green cross flamboyant red. Taking a cherry from the bowl, I think of you. A bumpy train journey with a small Tupperware. I get quicker at removing the stones, 
my tongue manoeuvring each cherry across my teeth. I spit the pits into a plant pot. Not your first present to remind me of Cezanne. Is there a mysterious connection? My own natural expressionist? Chopping three more to put in a glass of cider, I think of you, at this very table where I write. An evening of music. Trying to remember the last time I had a peach, I make a conscious decision to buy two, one for each of us. Soon. Orange fades to yellow. Black shadows hard on white pottery. The Large Bathers or Les Grandes Bagneurs. Limited motion inwards. The skin of a perfect left leg follows that of the right, presumably as lovely, though covered by another's behind. Through prevailing apathy the heat becomes tangible. The blue of roof tiles shimmers like water. The hair is sexual organ, for I find no other way to differentiate otherwise ungendered big-breasted bathers. First seeing the large bathers, I thought foolishly the figures to have been deemed large by the painter. In fact, all his bathers were in this way beautiful, made even more magnificent by the titular grandness of this unique canvas. The brown of the dry grass as smooth as each darkening naked body. The air dusty. The definition of each object and the depth of each colour decreasing with each yard away from the artist. Or should I say metre. The Railway Cutting A trickler of a forgotten European state. Blue dominates, meaning vigilance tenacity and justice. The gentle arc of the cutting rolls into the rugged arc of a mountain. I believe here I fell for Cezanne. Meticulously I print it off, laminate it, then trim it, just to stare at it. The sheen of the plastic, the sunlight distorted by the window, caresses the blue and white signal box. A favourite painter. Such a strange idea. Not like a favourite person, or body. I cannot remember first falling for her. Initially I found and plugged in the laminator to make some over-sentimental gift, the railway cutting an afterthought. I balance it on the rim of my monitor. So aggressively landscape, slicing the hillside like that, the unseen track holding unseen images, pulling carriages elsewhere. A similar phenomena runs behind my childhood home, an unnaturally flat line, an echo of a track that disappeared half a century ago. A bridge still carries nothing over the country road. I stand on artificially raised ground and stare through the trees to the green cutting ahead, the sky not as blue as Cezanne's, and the field not deserted but dotted with sheep. Walking back over the occasional rotten sleeper, I wonder what a painting that might have made. Self-Portrait, 1879 Less friendly than when Pizarro painted you. The lack of a hat, perhaps? Defying the thin diamonds that frame it on the wall, your head widens, the green becomes your coat, the white your shirt and temples. In your eyes I see lakes and rooftops, the tricksy features of incomplete landscapes still holding your attention, despite this brief refocusing to the personal. Younger in appearance, though older in fact than when Pizarro painted you, caused I imagine by humility rather than vanity, you have been placed upon a grey wall between two of your more usual works, offshore of Lestac, chilled by Provence winds. Pizarro's effort has been isolated in the corner of the next room. Pyramid of Skulls Mould has grown on the cherries, a thin layer of off-white fur. Immediately I think of the skulls, similarly forgotten, unburied, unburned, perfectly rounded, heaped upon fresh white cloth. The cherry halfway to my mouth when I notice. 
my lips open as though to speak to someone already dead. Staring into shadows, more skulls. Top left shows almost life, thin skin covering the bones of a right hand. Below the displaced red of blood, or of cherries. <laughs>